Okay, hi everyone, and welcome to our first episode of the Journal of Neuromuscular Diseases podcast. My name is Grace McMacken. I'm a trainee neurologist working in the NHS in the UK, and I'm in the very privileged position of being able to interview some of the world experts in neuromuscular disease for this podcast. So we hope this podcast will be of general interest and relevance to lots of neurologists, geneticists and scientists out there who want to try and keep their knowledge up to date in neuromuscular diseases. And we're going to be choosing some of the what we think are the most exciting papers from the journal to discuss on the podcast. And today I'm delighted to be joined by the very esteemed Dr. Karsten Boneman who is Senior Investigator and Chief of the Neuromuscular and Neurogenetics Disorders of Childhood Section at the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke in the US. You're very welcome, Karsten. Thank you for joining us today. Hello, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. And you are here to discuss the recent meeting report that was published in JND um, from the Muscular Dystrophy Association Summit on the safety and challenges in gene therapy. Yes. So this is a really interesting report. Very timely. Um, Yes, indeed. This is obviously a a very challenging topic um, for a lot of general neurologists like me. Um, It can feel like quite a daunting topic and maybe something we don't get a lot of exposure to in our general everyday practice. Um, But at the same time, it's something we need to know about, right? Our patients come and they, they ask us questions about what's happening in clinical trials and we need to know. Um, could you start off by giving us just a little bit of background about what the main kind of approaches to gene therapy that are happening in the field uh, at the moment? Yeah, gene therapy in general, you could um, maybe say it more um, uh, broadly as genetic therapy. So therapies that are that are really directed at the genetic cause of, of a condition. And in, in neuromuscular disease, of course, we have um, both acquired as well as genetic um, uh, conditions and the acquired ones are usually uh, immunologically based, so the immune system is uh, acting up and and causing the disease. So that requires a different approach, as opposed to disorders that are caused by genetic variants, pathogenic genetic variants, which are the cause of the disease. Really, and a gene is dysfunctional, and that really sets into motion the entire um, disease that we have to reckon with. And the idea um, behind genetic therapies is that the closer you go to where the disease actually starts, its origin, the more your impact will be. And so in genetic disease, that means rather than trying to modify the uh, consequences of the disease and what happens in muscle, and uh, we want to go to where the disease starts, where the mutation is, where the genetic origin of the disease is. Now that, um, having having said that, it, it, it uh, really doesn't mean that our um, therapies that were currently applied to patients to uh, manage them uh, medically uh, are not to be valued. As a matter of fact, they're probably more impactful than anything that we do at the moment in genetic therapy um, by just, just appropriate and and, uh, and, and really um, proactive medical management. That really remains and, and will be even more so in the field of genetic therapies, a, a main a, a, a part of, of treating and, and managing a patient. So a shout out to all medical management specialists in neuromuscular disease. Genetic therapy is not uh, taking that away. It, it actually makes it more important. But having said that, um, so, so there are various approaches to go after the genetic origin of, of the disease. You could, um, you could try to uh, modify the gene. Um, so that's uh, gene editing that's on uh, on walk at the moment, but still quite preclinical, where you where you really uh, edit the gene and you're trying to um, correct the mutation in the gene. But you could also do um, editing of the the transcript, so the messenger or the RNA, the readout of the gene. So where the mutation is translated into the messenger RNA before it is uh, made into protein, you could intervene there, and that's. The uh, the um, RAM of ASO antisense oligonucleoid therapies, uh, where for instance with exon skipping, you can reframe a transcript into Shen muscular dystrophy, or uh, in the uh, in the uh, case of mucinersin, you can splice modulate um, the SMN backup copy to make good SMN. 
Um, so, so those are um, transcript-directed therapies that are editing the transcript to uh, modify it and make it more um, useful to the body, kind of correct the mutation or at least ameliorate the mutation. And then we have also um, therapies where we try to inactivate uh, mutations that are damaging dominant mutations. So that's the case in FSHD or myotonic dystrophy, where you have a mutation uh, that that is causing a toxic gain of function, a dominant negative effect, where you have to really um, try to get rid of that, um, to inactivate it, to uh, take it out of the system to ameliorate the effect of dis the disease. And then lastly, and most um, probably advanced, um, because we already have uh, approved therapies for that, is gene replacement. And that um, really is um, where most people think, um, or what most people think about when they hear the term gene therapy, which is uh, viral-mediated gene replacement therapy. So what that is, is where you have a, a gene that is just in general dysfunctional. It's not um, working properly or is entirely missing because of the pathogenic variants taking it out. There's no good protein being made from that gene. Uh, here, you're trying to sneak in a replacement copy of it, a processed version of it, a cDNA, a smaller um, already processed version of the gene. Um, so it, it's not uh, exons and introns, it's really the message spliced together. We call that cDNA, where it can be read directly into protein. And that is um, put under a, a governing element called a promoter that drives it in, in muscle or nerve, wherever it's uh, needed. And then the trick is to package it into a virus. Uh, and the virus is no longer a viable virus. The uh, virus is just a shell, if you will, of its former self. What we use is the viral envelope uh, to package the replacement gene copy into that, use that viral envelope to infect the body and uh, thereby muscles and nerves, wherever it needs to go. And then uh, the envelope would deliver uh, the transgene, the replacement copy of the gene, uh, and deliver it to the cell, but not replicate. So it's a one-time infection, essentially, and then the virus goes out of the system, and the replacement copy stays um, in the cell nucleus, uh, where uh, it's needed in the cells of the muscle and nerves, depending on where it's needed. And then of that copy will be um, made a messenger RNA and a protein. And that protein now is the wild type or as close to normal as it can possibly be. Uh, sometimes you have to engineer to package it. We can get to that later. Uh, and then you have basically the good stuff on board, the replacement part on board. And then the cell can work with that and get around the genetic defect. So that's the idea behind um, virally mediated gene replacement therapy. Okay, fantastic. That's a really nice overview of all of the different approaches. Um, I think the focus of the MDA summit, if I'm right in saying, was the kind of viral mediated gene therapy, which yes, sometimes exactly. interchangeably we use the term kind of gene therapy, just to, we're, when we say that we're really talking about the, the viral mediated, the AAV gene therapy. Um, and am I right in saying that as sort of more clinical trials have been um, been taking place with this types of therapy, there's some safety challenges coming to light, um, and particularly the immunological safety. Is that right? That is exactly right. So the um, the the working horse, if you if you were the kind of the, the package that works the best and where we have the most experience is AAV, which is called adeno associated virus, and that's a a small little virus um, that occurs in nature in many different versions. It has a, a single-stranded DNA in it, and it likes to infect people, but it doesn't cause disease. So it, um, what it does, it kind of spreads around. It, uh, it uh, infects people and replicates using other viruses to help it. Its genome itself is too small. It doesn't have all the parts it needs to be assembled again as a virus. Uh, why it's called adeno-associated virus. So for instance, it comes along with adenovirus, a much bigger virus for the right. They co-infect together, and then AAV, the little guy, uses some of the genetic information of the big guy, the adenovirus, to reassemble itself into another infectious particle. And so um, that's why it's called AAV. And it, it, in, in its own right alone, without any other infection coming along, it actually doesn't cause disease. So that, uh, that really um, is very important because it is... Uh, 
giving us a, a safety margin in biogene therapy that that's so important. And so what you do in the lab is you um, basically provide everything that's needed to build this envelope in the lab in, in cell culture, the helper genes, the genes of the AAV itself, uh, so that you have all the components to make that envelope, that infectious particle. Uh, but it doesn't have the viral genes in it. It has the transgene, the one that you want to deliver in it. Uh, you sneak it into the envelope so that now you have an envelope that's infectious, but it doesn't have any viral particles in it that allow us to replicate. Um, so it just is, is, a, is a delivery envelope. However, the envelope is a protein structure and uh, a protein structure that looks exactly identical to the actual virus. Um, it just has a different inert uh, in it. And so the immune system sees a viral particle for sure. Uh, and so that's um, um, not in itself uh, immediately a problem, but it, of, of course, uh, means that once you've been infected by this viral particle, even in, 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 in the natural environment, if you use a natural viral particle that's out in the environment and you use it also as a gene therapy factor, if that person has been exposed to that viral particle before, the immune system has seen it and has uh, antibodies against it. And so you're basically immunized against it and your viral gene therapy will no longer be effective. And that's that's one of the major problems um, because there's a natural immunity against some of the serotypes that is out there uh, in uh, in people and those who have sufficiently high antibodies against the viral particle that you're planning to use for the gene therapy will not be helped by it because the immune system will not allow uh, for the virus to enter the cells. It just takes it out uh, and you're, you're basically immune. Also, you can't um, redose. Once you have um, a dose gene therapy in a person who's immunonaive, hasn't seen the virus before, once you've given the gene therapy, now you have immunized that person and you can't top it up. Uh, 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 you, you can't give it again. Uh, you have an, one shot with that virus um, to, to give it. And so that's one of the challenges one has to address in, in virally mediated gene therapy, um, that kind of pre-existing immunity a problem and that redosing problem. And that redosing problem is, is really a problem that um, we need to come to grips to, um, in particular in, in muscle disease, uh, where we want to, in pediatric muscle disease, where we want to treat a child very early on in life with the gene therapy. But then when you do that, um, the uh, muscle will grow and the child will get bigger. There will be new uh, uh, nuclei, new muscle cells being recruited to grow the muscle. And uh, the gene therapy in the muscle cell it's actually only good for that one muscle nucleus. When the, uh, when the cell divides, it's not given uh, to the offsprings of the cells, meaning in other words, as the body grows and the cells divide, you dilute out your gene therapy, you lose it over time. And, and so uh, therefore we need to get ready to be um, prepared to find strategies to redose. And those strategies were discussed at this meeting uh, as well to see, can we do immune modulation so that we trick the body in not recognizing the virus? Can we change the viral envelope so that it can sneak around the immune system the next time around? Can we give medications and strategies to suppress the immune system at the time of redosing so that there's no um, immune uh, uh, attack against the virus when it's given again? And all of these are being uh, investigated at the moment. Am I right in this is a, something that's a pretty common problem? I mean, is there a level of immune response in almost every patient? Well, yeah, so the, um, yes, so to every patient you give a gene therapy will be immune against the same vector of the gene therapy next time around. It just doesn't matter. It is, uh, it is really um, a vaccination as it is the gene therapy. So you give the gene therapy and the gene therapy um, gets in and does its thing, but you are now vaccinated against the vector, against the viral envelope that you've used. Um, so while that doesn't cause any problem uh, in its own right, uh, it is a problem because you can't redose. And that's, um, so every patient who is exposed to the gene therapy will be immune to the next round of gene therapy using the same vector. Uh, so that's, um, it, uh, we we don't quite know how much of a problem that is because we're at such an early stage of gene therapy. We know the durability of gene therapy once it's in there effectively is long. If you if you um, give it to nerve cells, nerve cells no longer divide, and so there you don't have that problem of dividing cells losing the gene therapy. And so we hope that there the effect is long, 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 like an SMA. 
Uh, but in muscle disease, where the muscle cells do divide as the children grow and the patient gets bigger and the muscle heals from the disease, hopefully, uh, we don't know when that kind of peters out and we need to uh, uh, top up. Hopefully years and years, um, so we have time to prepare for it. But, but well, it's just something we don't, we don't know yet, but have to prepare for because it's predictable that we need to. Sure, yeah. And I suppose, I mean, a lot of the disorders that we're talking about here are primary muscle diseases, right? Yes. I mean, are there other challenges that are specific to how we deliver gene therapy to muscle diseases? Yeah, so the muscle disease um, is is uh, uh, one problem of muscle disease, if you will, is the sheer size of the, the organ, the, the sheer, sheer volume of, of tissue that you have to target, the number of muscles. And so with the current um, versions of AAV, the natural serotypes that we use, it means you have to give, <laughs> let's say, ridiculously high doses of this stuff um, to patients to really get uh, effectively into into muscle, and if you give it intravenously to in in the bloodstream, then of course most of it goes first into the liver, uh, where it's not needed and can only cause <laughs> problems by uh, by by uh, flooding the liver. But it also floods the entire immune system at that um, point early on, and, and the immune system um, has has two arms to it. It has an, an an innate arm is which which reacts to foreign particles without without clearly knowing what they are. Um, and the adaptive immune system, which is the specific immune system that we recognize the particle, the same one when it comes back. And the innate, innate uh, immune system is quicker and more reactive because it kind of needs to fend off foreign things uh, as quickly as possible. And these very high doses of certain viruses can trigger um, uh, aspects of the innate immune system and also of the um, complement system, which is... Uh, a system that is part of the innate immune system. And what the complement system can do, it can trigger a cascade of events that leads to um, a clotting and, uh, and a use up of, of, of thrombocytes, little blood platelets. Uh, it can lead to um, vascular abnormalities and multi-organ failure. We call that thrombotic microangiopathy, TMA. Um, that is um, one of the... Um, are probably biggest uh, safety hurdles of this very high dose gene therapy that we have to give for muscle disease for certain serotypes at the moment. Um, so just by the nature of having to do these high doses, uh, we are risking to trigger this TMA, this thrombotic microangiopathy, uh, which can uh, uh, be quite severe, can uh, lead to incentive care and uh, and also in uh, in rare cases to, to, to death if the uh, multi-organ failure cannot be reversed. And so one one uh, way out of that, of course, is to see where can we get away with lower doses um, so that we don't flood the body with these uh, ultra high uh, doses. And, and that's another development uh, of um, capsid engineering that we discussed at the meeting, uh, which is to design, to custom design to uh, uh, capsids, to identify capsids, meaning envelopes of the virus, that are changed in a way that they home into muscle much more readily uh, and, uh, and don't uh, get hung up in the liver as much. And so these are myotropic or muscle-specific viral capsids um, that are now being developed by in a number of different groups uh, where you have a much higher likelihood to get into muscle at a much lower dose. And so that means um, that you can re decrease, uh, decrease your overall dose that you have to give to the patient, gets less to the liver, it doesn't trigger the uh, innate immune system as much, and you can uh, uh, increase your safety margin considerably. That's a hope. hasn't been given to humans yet, but it's in, in preclinical development and will probably be the next wave of, of uh, muscle-directed biogene therapy. We'll make use of various forms of these myotropic, more specific designer envelopes um, that, are, that are really selected to be better at going into a muscle. So hopefully that'll be um, helpful in uh, yeah. in ameliorating that part of it yeah absolutely and, and just to touch on that um you mentioned some preclinical research i mean were were most of these types of responses expected from animal models not really so that's a that's a really good point um so the immune system is is quite quite intricate and and probably um one of the most complex biological systems we're walking around with next to the brain, really, in, in its complexity. Uh, and uh, it is very hard to 
first of all, fool the immune system, and secondly, to uh, predict the human uh, immune system in sufficient detail to kind of predict these things. And so um, these TMA responses can now be modeled somehow in, in vitro now it, that we know what's going on, but they haven't been predicted in preclinical models, not even in the dog models, You're absolutely right. Um, so there is always this first in human um, that, that that really is, uh, is still a first in human. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. And so there's huge challenges to overcome, but I'm sure this still feels like a very exciting thing to be working in at the minute. Yes, it is. Um, the, uh, the 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 good, the good good thing, of course, is that gene therapy is um, starting to fulfill its promises. So, in, in spinal muscular atrophy, I think that's a shining example where uh, where the gene therapy early on uh, can can really. Um, make such a difference for the disease. Myotubular myopathy, a, a congenital myopathy, is another example where um, where the impact on the disease um, looks like it can be tremendous, but where we run into safety issues again. And, and this this is an, an, another interesting example in myotubular myopathy. Uh, four boys died um, with this gene therapy and, and cholestatic liver failure. Uh, so it looked like the gene therapy uh, triggered um, a liver process that was irreversible and these uh, mm -hmm. boys succumbed to it. And what turned out to be the case is another important lesson here. It's not only the um, impact of the virus onto the liver that triggered this, but it's also that the liver was actually part of the disease. So the, the cholestasis was actually part of the myopathy, uh, of myotubular myopathy. It was a, a disease aspect that wasn't really fully recognized and uh, so these boys with myotubular myopathy are prone to cholestatic liver disease by intercurrent infections, by other triggers, by certain susceptibilities that are uh, not fully understood. And then the gene therapy, this onslaught of the virus onto the liver, overwhelmed this kind of pre-diseased -pre liver and, and basically led to this failure of, uh, of, of liver function in, in, in the few boys who succumbed to it. And, uh, the... Uh, Interesting aspect of that is the gene therapy was designed to treat muscle. So the little promoter that drives the gene therapy was a muscle promoter, meaning it's not on in the liver. But the liver also needed to be treated because now we know it's part of the disease. Uh, so that gene therapy does a lot of good for the muscle, but it didn't treat the liver because the promoter, the driving element, wasn't on in the liver. And therefore, the liver was left unprotected. Uh, when the gene therapy hit it. And so understanding this in this uh, great detail now will help us to design avenues that also address the liver susceptibility and make a safer product to really take um, full advantage of the benefit this gene therapy has for muscle. So one has to learn step by step. So here we have a disease susceptibility that wasn't fully recognized that we have to encounter. Um, the other aspect of, of, of gene therapy, um, so we talked about, you know, the patient susceptibility, we talked about the immunology or relating to the vector itself, to the capsid, but there's also an aspect uh, of, of what you deliver to the body. So you, you deliver a, a new protein, a transgene. And um, I, I use um, the example of, of organ transplantation. So when you uh, transplant an organ, uh, that has a lot of foreign epitopes to the recipient, you treat the immune system to allow it to tolerate the organ. In gene therapy, in cases where you have mutations that don't allow the protein to be made in the patient, the patient's immune system will be naive to that protein. The protein has never been seen by the patient because the mutation doesn't allow for the protein to be made. Now, when you deliver um, a, a replacement protein with the gene therapy, you're basically delivering a new molecule molecule to the body. It's a, it's a new single molecule transplantation that you do. And the immune system will take notice. It will see, well, this is, uh, I've never seen this before, we better get rid of it and can attack the transgene. And that's something that happened um, uh, in uh, in the uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy gene therapy trials, and that we also discussed extensively at this meeting, and um, that is mentioned in the report and also published uh, uh, as, as a letter, um, where in, uh, in several of the different um, gene therapy trials that were ongoing at the time, uh, four boys, uh, five boys actually, um, had suffered a, a severe reaction uh, that looked like an inflammatory muscle disease, a myositis. 
uh, some about three weeks after uh, after gene transfer, uh, there was massive um, increase in weakness, uh, difficulties breathing. Uh, some patients also had um, uh, myocarditis, and, and it looked like there was an immune system uh, attack against uh, against the muscle. What happened um, at the time? Francesco Montoni, who had um, really an overview of all these trials, recognized that there were similar things happening in all these different trials and basically raised um, the alarm, if you will, with, with the sponsors and companies to say, well, look, this this is happening across the different trials. Let's figure out what's going on. And so he, uh, he also contacted me as well as the sponsors, and we got together and said, well, how about if we come together quickly and compare notes just to try to understand what's happening to these boys? And that uh, was, for me, very, very encouraging because there was no um, roadblocks. There was no... Um, pushing back, everyone said, yes, let's do this immediately. And everyone came together, um, including advisors, no lawyers, as far as I could tell, were involved. You just came together and uh, and, and looked at what was happening. And what was happening was very um, interesting. So in, in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, gene therapy is complicated by the size of the protein that you have to deliver. Um, so the dystrophin um, messenger RNA and the protein is, is very large and it doesn't fit into AAV because AAV has a, a packaging capacity limit. It's just a small guy, it's a small virus. So there is a limit what you can package into it. Um, so the dystrophin um, replacement gene in its full length doesn't fit into it. And so what you have to do is, and that's uh, years and years of work uh, inspired also by patients that people have seen, is to, to cut it down, to bring it down in size to a a microdystrophin, you know, a dystrophin that has its working ends and all the relevant parts um, that are needed to do um, a, a reasonably good job, but it doesn't have the full length of it. So it's not as good as the full length dystrophin, but it's better than nothing. And that can be cut down to a size that fits into into the AAV. And this, these are called microdystrophins. They're basically missing the inner parts of the repetitive structure of the gene, but they maintain the business ends at either end, plus kind of important stuff in the middle that uh, allows it to function. Um, but these business ends um, they, they are, are common to all these microdystrophins that are delivered. Uh, so they are proteins, they're kind of peptides that are, um, that are part of this microdystrophin. And it turned out that Five boys who um, who had this um, adverse event happening had mutations that were deletions, lack of genetic information that corresponded exactly um, to the protein that was delivered with the microdystrophins. So, in other words, they were immunonaive for that part of the microdystrophin. The immune system has never had a chance to learn it, uh, to recognize it, to develop tolerance. And what what happened in these cases is the immune system immediately picked up on it. Uh, generated cytotoxic T cells to attack um, this part of the uh, protein and uh, and really attack with it the muscle and, and the heart of these boys. And this analysis allowed us to um, to really pinpoint on the most offensive part of the protein that is really uh, causing this and say, well, this is really the culprit. And the lessons from that um, are important because it uh, for, for one, it allowed to, um, for the time being, to exclude patients who are uh, completely deleted for that part of the microdystrophin, so who are at high risk of, of developing this attack. It also um, allows us to, to then um, start thinking about immune modulation protocols akin to organ transplantation, uh, where you can prepare and, uh, and, and treat the immune system to not attack and develop tolerance over time. You're really taking your leads and your, your ideas from organ transplantation so that in the end, every um, boy can be treated with these microdystrophins. But it really was, um, was uh, I think, a, 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 a learning on the fly while these trials were ongoing um, that allowed to, to really home in and say, well, this is happening here. We, this is what we need to do in the short term. And this is what we do need to do in the long term to really assure, um, um, first of all, safety, but then also um, uh, to, to allow for the gene therapy to get to people who have this risk genotype. And so with the approved, currently approved gene therapy uh, product uh, in, in microdystrophin, this, this is still an exclusion criteria. So boys who have this type of deletion cannot be treated even with the approved gene therapy product because of this risk. 
uh, until it is uh, addressed with better immune uh, treatments. Yeah, I mean, it, it was a really fascinating pathological mechanism there. I mean, these were very serious adverse events, weren't they? And I think the thing that struck me about it was, like you say, just how quickly you could advance through and figure that out when you collaborated so closely together and, and just openly shared all that information. Very true. Very true. Very true. Yeah, I hope I hope that was a, and and I, I think um, it was recognized by all um, commercial and and academic sponsors that were part of this team, uh, and um, we're planning to kind of continue that spirit for for other, if you will, class effects of gene therapy, where it's not the individual product that is at fault, but the kind of the the approach itself, the virus, sure. um, the immune system, things that are class effect that we have to address as as a field together. Uh, and because gene therapy is still in its infancy and the numbers of patients for well, most products is very small. And if, mm -hmm. uh, for, of course, for, for the SMA gene therapy, it's not in the thousands, but, but for the others, it's still very small. Um, so that we have to kind of pool data and compare data as, as much as we can to figure out these safety issues as they arise in the human application. Uh, and you pointed out, um, that it is so hard to predict these in preclinical studies, and it's true. So we have to we have to be um, cognizant and and alert um, that things will arise only when we move into humans. And when we do that, we need to be um, able to share and communicate almost in real time to be able to anticipate and treat them appropriately. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think you've given us a really fantastic background. Um, hopefully whet lots of people up, people's appetite to find out more about gene therapy and, and all these amazing new things we're learning about diseases as well as how we react to gene therapy as we as we move these through clinical trials. You can read a lot more in detail if you um, want to check out the paper that's open access in the journal in JND. You, there's some there's lots more information that we haven't touched on here today, Karsten. Um, including a lot of information around the ethical issues of gene therapy, which could be a, a, a different podcast in its own right, of course. But I want to thank you again for your time. You've gone through that in the way only a true expert could and made it very accessible to all of us. So thank you so much. And hopefully we'll have you back on the podcast again. Thanks for having me. If you enjoyed the podcast, you can read the full paper and lots more in the Journal of Neuromuscular Diseases. And to keep up to date, you can follow us on social media and subscribe to our newsletter.